Let's go. Welcome to the Football Show on PLZ Soccer's YouTube channel and uh, I'm delighted to see uh, with me today Hugh McDonald and Davey McKinnon. You can tell we're all geared mm. up ready to talk about things because Davey started talking before the music kicked in. That's <laughs> how just keep going. We've keep got going, lots huh? to talk about on our uh, show today and I'm delighted Davey McKinnon is with us and of course Hugh McDonald because quite simply uh, we've got lots to talk about. VAR never too far away from our hot topic of conversation. We've got unhappy managers, unhappy players and of course course there's no shortage of controversy in the background with some managers and players departing their clubs um, but they haven't quite decided to tell all <laughs> just yet um, but it's coming um, what about the quiz question well I thought I'd look back in a wee bit of history because the voting is in for the PFA player of the year awards name the first player to win the SPFA and the SFWA awards in the same season one player managed that feat and remember uh, the writers and the players player of the year awards started it different times yep. but there was at one point one player um, the very first to win both in the same season I wonder if you can tell me who that is we'll give you the answer at the end of the programme um, good luck with that competition question as ever there'll be uh, the return of our uh, competition next week we'll be giving away some prizes as well some of the prizes that we've been giving away um, lots of people absolutely delighted with it if you haven't received yours yet it's in the post um, and we also like to engage with people with the emails and we'll be reading out a few of them um, from people who have been reacting to some of our stories um, so first and foremost there seems to be a fair bit of consternation um, about the VAR um, PFA Scotland claim that the players have lost faith in the system after Graham Shinney's call the players union has called for the frivolous appeal uh, that punishment of an extra game ban to be scrapped we'll get the thoughts of the two guys on this and the PFA Scotland players union said they back Aberdeen's call for the Shinney appeal to be looked at by a new panel and said they are deeply concerned about the discretionary power of the judicial panel uh, it also said players have lost faith in the system and that an appeal should be allowed without the threat of extra bans. So let's cut to the chase. From a player's perspective, Graham Shinney, red card or not? These days it's a red card. Um, I had many tackles like that in my career and actually get commended in dispatches. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but the game's changed completely. Um, I think, you know, there's... Uh, these you know rules and regulations that we speak about you know i've never seen a definitive list of what uh, constitutes a red card or a yellow card and i think it'd probably be from a pr exercise i think the governing body should maybe publish that somewhere in, in um you know terms that people can understand because i think there's probably you know 20 30 clauses in a book somewhere that so you're calling for maybe it's a, a situation where you're calling for uh, Crawford Allen and maybe some referees to get together and, and release here is a 30 second or a minute video Absolutely. to explain that thing that happened at the weekend clarification that's that's what players and uh, and and you know I think the thing is if you're a, a player on the pitch you know and you're a habitual tackler or whatever you're never going to change your game but it's close to the edge. What is you know what will constitute a red card? I don't think players, the players I've spoken to, don't quite understand what the rules are now. Uh, and I know that the SFA came out with the you know the, this a normal thing that well they're invited someone a representative comes to them at the start of the season talks through it. But you know being in dressing rooms a lot, some players don't mm. even listen to, to what's going on and they don't understand it. Put it in layman's terms, explain what it is and players will try and uh, adhere to it and if they don't do that then it's going to continue. Well that's all well and good but um, you, you know it seems fairly straightforward to do that but earlier in the season it wasn't so much the fact that we were getting that anger towards certain decisions but then it started to gather pace and it was not anger about a decision it was anger about the consistency of certain decisions you know and if a referee or a VAR assistant is interpreting it one way and then the next week it changes completely shot pulling mm. handball you I name it it's been a nightmare yeah it's and, and that is where it is difficult because the first thing that any mass more of any team will say but that last week yeah, that wasn't a penalty and it's a penalty this week uh, that's a difficulty we've uh, on the the, 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 the the thing with Shinny, Shinny's a red card all day of the week, twice on a Sunday, it's just a red card. Now, people go, but, but he got the, it doesn't matter if he got the ball. Completely irrelevant. 
And see, when you say that, you can see players bristling. What do you mean it's completely irrelevant to go? That doesn't impinge on the red card decision. The red card decision is about going in too fast, going in recklessly, and endangering the opponent. Yeah. The law doesn't mention the ball. The ball's got to be in an area. That's another tick. If the ball was outside a certain area, that would be another tick for a red card. But again, the, the, again, the ball you know, doesn't matter. Now, a lot of, you'll see a lot of pundits in Aberdeen uh, statement. Actually, we've talked to pundits, but you've talked to pundits that don't know the law. Yeah, I, well, I read that. I, I read that yesterday and was absolutely aghast by that line uh, that came out uh, yesterday. Say some time immemorial when when I played. Every week you played and there was an interpretation by a referee because no. he's the ultimate arbiter. He makes a decision and what he how he in, interprets a situation um, and we, weekly. You know, decisions mm. that were made, you got away with something the previous week, mm. you wouldn't get away with it. But what's happened now, it's highlighted all over with, you know, with the VAR. Exactly. So it's on the, film. So as you say, they've opened a can of worms, really, you know. Absolutely. And, and, and if every decision is going to be second guess and second, I mean, I, I, I don't, you, the VAR's here, you know, you're not going to get rid of it. It's here. The, yeah. Because the tele companies love it and the tele companies run the game. The tele companies pay for the game, tells what time the kickoffs are, tells, them, tells who's going to win the Champions League. Tell us, tell us of them, right? So they, they want it, so it's staying. But football's got to kick back and say, right, see if we're having this, we're going to have it for certain, certain things. And the first thing I would say is, we're going to have it for matters of fact. Yeah, can I ask you this then? Absolutely. What about the situation? There's a double edged sword on this one because it gathers pace on the basis that Aberdeen then made the appeal. There's, <laughs> it's a double edged sword on the basis that not only did they make the appeal, which the SFA deemed to be frivolous, right? Which the PFA is saying, listen, mm. you can't give them an extra game ban. That, we just need to get rid of that. That's the first thing. The second part of that, uh, you know, the second part of that is, is just pl is, are they playing the system? Yeah, I think, see, I've got great admiration for the PFA, Peter, and you know uh, the admiration I've got for Fraser Russia. I just think that statement's completely and utterly wrong. I don't even think somebody's thought about that statement. You, know, you could drive a bus and that and say, oh, we just should be allowed to appeal forever. If there is no sanction for appeals, every, every red card will be appealed because everybody will say, well, what's the downside? Well, it's a red card, the automatic thing, we'll, we'll just appeal it anyway. And if yeah. you do that, I don't know how many red cards are in Scottish football every week. Five, six in the, in the four senior leagues, right? Say there's one a league every week. You've got to have a committee for each one of them. Well, the other thing about it is, remember as well, Davey, and, and this is something which I think might not please a lot of people, but quite simply, if there's a loophole, you bet your bottom dollar they're all into it. You're absolutely right, but I think the thing is, like you know, this frivolous thing. Mm. Um, been involved in the the executive side of football, um, you know, very rarely, in fact, never did uh, anyone in the board or the chief executive basically go to the manager and say, "I think we should appeal this." It was it's the other way about. The yeah. player says, yeah. "I think you know, I was wrongly treated there. I was harshly treated." The manager says, "I agree." Can we appeal? Because remember, yeah. it costs you money to oh, appeal. So it's a thousand pounds, but I'm only going to say this back. again. <laughs> yeah. Here's the point. 70s and 80s, mm. if you appealed before the, before the quick decision came mm -hmm. in, yep. they looked at it and said, well, appeal because we need him for the next game. Uh, We're quite willing to lose him to I'm afraid I've done that myself. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. But that's, but that's because there was a loophole there. Yeah. So they thought, let's exploit it. And then what happened is they said, well, wait a minute. If you're going to appeal... If you lose it, you're paying the money. And then the second thing that they brought in was, was by the way, we'll, we'll, we'll assemble the team quickly on the Thursday. So if you're appealing on the Wednesday, bang, bang it's done. done. But you've got, I mean, any, do you see the, the rationale behind that? You can't have an appeal without jeopardy. Because if you have an appeal without jeopardy, everybody's going to appeal. Because everybody's, the manager's not going to come to, to Davey as chief executive and say, I ain't going to appeal. I'll just say, well, we'll just appeal. Because who knows? And the guy said, well, you actually took his leg off and he had to get it sewn back on. Well, we'll just appeal it anyway. Yeah, yeah. Because what's the downside? Well, that's it. And I mean, I, I, mean, I don't think that they will scrap the, the, 
the rule about a frivolous appeal. I think I think that will remain. Frivolous, do you know something? It's all about words. Yeah. And frivolous is a bad choice of words. But you can see from both sides, you can see why the player is saying, do you know, and the club saying that? No, this wasn't frivolous to us. We think we've got a yeah. case. And you can see why the SFA is saying, no, we've deemed it frivolous. What they mean is, we've deemed it as... You're at it. This was a real. This was Pure, a real sending off. You've seen the last twenty years. <laughs> in the last twenty years, appeals appeals panels have been met with some of the top end lawyers. Oh, why? That's where the game's changed. Oh, for- because the powers and the real powers in the Scottish game have said, "Let's get a team of crack lawyers in here, and we'll argue over your words, and we'll argue over well, your well, sentence." Well, why wouldn't you? If you're paying a player twenty grand a week, right? Thirty grand a week, forty grand a week, and he can't play. You're paying him 40 grand for nothing. Why not pay a lawyer five grand to see if he's got a chance of playing on the Saturday? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a simple equation. Well, yeah. On the other end, you know, uh, any appeal that I've, you know, um, attended uh, as uh, chief executive has been, there's been an independent panel there, mm. which is unrelated to, to a referee or, yeah. or to the SFA. And to be fair, uh, I thought, you know, you get a really good hearing mm. from them. I think they actually... They understand. They don't. They, they, they don't get emotional about it. Yeah, it's it's fact. It's you thought you get a good hearing as a player, or did you think I'm talking about it for um, one of our managers, one two yeah. managers that I had to take their because um, the amount of players in your day who used to say to me, yeah, yeah, we made the appeal and we went up there and we sat at the end of a big long wooden desk and then we get <laughs> we get a <laughs> fine. <laughs> Didn't really matter, yeah. you know. But nowadays, yeah. you know, a lot of people are now. There's a microscope on it, and as you mentioned there, they're dissecting the words and they're saying, well, we're not happy with the way you worded that. It's not a frivolous appeal. We think... The other one here, which I think is just bordering on naughty, is we're not happy with the result. We want another jury. <laughs> you know, I mean, come on. You, uh, see, that, see, this is where... This is where you can't... You, can, you either... See, at one point, you've got to say, we buy into this process, right? For good or ill... We buy into the process. We buy into it as, as a club that you can get fined if you lose it. We buy into it that the board, the appeal panel is set up in a certain way. We buy into that process because if suddenly you start to say, well, we don't like that, we don't like that, you say, well, fine. But that's a different process. We'll have to set up, we'll have to set up a different process. Yeah. And the idea of, let's have a, <laughs> we don't like this panel because it didn't agree with our decision. <laughs> well, I mean, I, we're all at that. We don't like a bit of that action. Just yeah. keep giving us a panel to the agree with us. Do you think, do you think it's, it's a wee bit, it's, um, it's almost behind a, you know, a cloak that, that what goes on and, you know, there's very little, it's a decision mm. made. I've never once seen here is the reasons why we've yeah. made this decision yeah. so you then that, that's open to debate yeah. but it's interpretation and, and, and I think the, the communication um, of the whole process of the, the VAR um, you, know, the, you know the disciplinaries mm. I think the communication could be better uh, absolutely people, yeah. people would say well yeah, I understand uh, that see well, if you, the, the great thing in the Bundesliga you've got in the German League is that the referee will all come out after he won't take questions because then that opens another can of worms so. he'll say they'll not say why he says this is why I gave a decision yeah. and the shinny one the referee says this is why I gave a decision because I didn't see it it's, it's I didn't done, see it I, I didn't I, 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 I didn't it? see it yeah. but when the the guy called me over to it. I saw that Graham had gone in recklessly yeah. and endangered the opponent and kicked him about, you know, kicked him on the ankle, yeah. and that's why it's a red card. Yeah. No that's questions, it, no supplementary. That's about. it. Finished then. Uh, yeah. It? It's yeah. A line right. yeah. But, but to be fair, you know, we are in a situation sometimes where managers come out right after a game and say, "I cannot believe that was a goal. Uh, I, I got it wrong." You know, handball, Michael Beale with Jota, <laughs> and then. You know, again, later on in the game, there's no way, you know, managers come in and go, there's no way that's a penalty. Then they go and see it and they go, oh, yeah. oh maybe I got but that wrong. But by that time, they've already thrown the grenade. Yeah, they, you know? Another thing about that is, you know yourself, if you're in your own line of work, whatever your line of work is, if you're, you know, working on live TV, your adrenaline's good. And if you're Michael Beale, he's just come out and he's lost a huge match. He's, he's lost a match that's got huge ramifications for the season and that, the, you know, the league's gone. He knows what the, the pressure's going to be the next day. And he's got, he's, he's got his season. I mean, can't you say, well, well the two centre-halves donated two goals and, and we missed a few centers. He's got to look for something to say, oh, you know, it's a natural human reaction. Yeah, another point of this um, as well is from the flip side of it, apart from obviously 
um, managers and players is the referees, whether they're on the park or indeed officiating as VAR officials. Stuart Kettlewell this morning was talking about maybe um, a bit of humility from the referees over the chaos. Um, you've been calling for maybe uh, the referees to come out and explain certain decisions uh, and how they managed to get to that decision. Um, but whether that happens or not as we move forward, only time will tell. Um, but whether there's a bit of humility that the Motherwell manager is calling for, God only knows. Um, obviously, big games coming up at the weekend. We sent Kerry out to Fir Park to get the thoughts of Stuart Kettlewell. Here at Fir Park this morning, Stuart Kettlewell has been looking ahead to what he described as the most difficult tie in the division, that being against Celtic this weekend at Celtic Park. As of late, Ange Postacoglu's side have been relentless, scoring over 100 goals so far this season. And Kettlewell believes this Celtic team are up there with the best of them. Look at the quality of players that, 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 that Celtic had then, and you look at some of the international players that Rangers have had through time and all of that, you know, they're, they're, they're top end guys, guys coming from teams successful in World Cups, you know, you look at some of the Dutch players, you look at um, so, you know, guys like Larson and all these types of players that were, for me, right up there with the with the best about, um, certainly across Europe for spells, um, and, and again, I look at it with, with Celtic, I know the game's changed in other leagues and the finances are different, but I think what Celtic are doing is they're, they're, they're unearthing some absolute gems that some of the top clubs will be sitting up and taking note of and, and full credit to them for doing that because it's very easy to spend a lot of money and bring in the finished article it's another thing to go into different markets and, and, and bring in players let's be honest that a lot of us had no no, no awareness of um, but certainly since they've put their boots in the ground in Scotland we can see the quality that, that they bring to Celtic. With only six games to go before the end of the season, Kettlewell believes there's still major errors being made when it comes to refereeing. And all the Motherwell boss wants is a bit of humility when it comes to decision making. You know, we can argue about rules, we can argue about uh, interpretations of rules, but I would just like to see, and, I, and I, listen, I always felt that that common sense aspect was the best way to go in officiating. Um, I always felt that when I was a player, and I know the game has changed completely since then, I always felt that the, the officials that you could speak to, that you could communicate with, that at times held their hands up when they made mistakes, because I make mistakes as a manager, players make mistakes on the park, but I, I always felt that when you hold your hands up to that mistake, at times players players have a, a kind of understanding and they have um, a bit of sympathy with you, that they know it's a, a difficult job. I think what I find hard at times is, and again this is only my opinion, when I see decisions that are wrong, that we still argue that we've got them right and sometimes I just think we would quite like to see that wee bit of humility just to make sure that everybody's on the same page, that we understand, yeah, it has been a mistake, but, you know, the weekend that I'm talking about, in my opinion, where I felt there was six or seven errors across six fixtures in the Premiership, then I, I don't think we can ever get to that stage, not with this system in play and not with the money that the football clubs are, are spending. It all takes place at Celtic Park this weekend. It's Celtic against Motherwell. Kick-off is at three o'clock. Yeah, and the sunshine there, thanks to mm -hmm. Kerry for that report. Humility, can't see that happening. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be trying to be fair to referees here as well, Hugh. You know, people are calling for humility, they're calling for consistency, uh, transparency. Um, the problem with all of that is the pressure these guys are under now, and they are getting it from all quarters. Yeah, and, and I, I, but I can see why they should they should be under pressure. I mean, because many times and David will know this. Many times in in, in Scottish Premier uh, Ship games, the referee will be the highest paid player on the park. He'll be the highest paid I guy in the park. Yeah. And certainly, if you go down to the Championship, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there should be pressure on it. You know, I mean, this is this is a, you know, it's a grand when you include the best part of a grand when you include the guy's expenses. So there should be pressure on it. Uh, my view of the Scottish thing, the Scottish refereeing things, is we've been caught up in this. Like every league has been caught up with this, with our, uh, with it. We, we, the English league is the biggest league in the world in terms of money and resources, and they've been caught on it. So we should be caught on it as well. I think see there's a way forward. What we could do is we could look at our referees and say, listen, we're going to educate you better. We're going to have see what we're going to try and do is have better referees because see the fact of the matter is. Our referees don't. Our referees are not looked upon kindly in Europe and the world. We don't get referees to World Cups. We don't get referees to to Euro finals. We don't get make them better. Well, don't ask me that question. That's the first thing to do. The first thing to do is go to somebody who's made referees better. Like you see, if you look at and say, 
the man, there's four Romanians have done, or there's two Scandinavians have done uh, Champions League finals. How did they get made better? And you go to the, the Danish FA and say, what was your, what, what was your plans? How did you make the referees better? And what will be, Peter, there'll be a simple answer, a broad answer, it'll be all about education, it'll be all about training, it'll all be about mentoring. Full time? I don't know if full time as everybody goes full time as a as a, as, a, as a panacea, but I don't know if I don't know if full time is. I think you need better mentoring. Mean, you know how to make quick decisions, how to referee. You look at it, and people say, "Oh, we've got a weird league, so how could you expect our referees to be?" Weird? You go, "Well, the Hungarian league's pretty wee, and they've got terrific referees that can do World Cup finals. The Polish league is pretty wee, a pole did the World Cup final." Yeah. I just wonder, Davey, just to finish on this one and we'll move on to the other things because there's there's another good 12 arguments we can have in this <laughs> programme today. Um, I, I just wonder if maybe we have suffered even greater problems in this country because our referees on the park and our referees in the VR just are not as good as uh, other countries. I think it's down, again, I said mm. down to communication because as a player, when I played, the referees spoke to you. Uh, they had uh, 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 an affinity with them. You related mm. to them. You sometimes you went to the pub for mm -hmm. a beer after them, but they, they would speak to you in, in a, a respectful manner. And if you speak to someone in a respectful manner, you get that back. Um, some of the referees now, um, and, and I think there's the, in my experience of referees as, as an executive, the ref there are some really really good referees who speak think about the game and think about the players they think about well, how mm -hmm. how's that player going to react to what I tell them yeah. but others ones just go straight as, as soon as a bit of confrontation headmaster of, pupil is that what you're saying I, instead of talking to them and actually talking them down or whatever they, it's immediately mm -hmm. it's a card and, and you know players lose res that's why they lose respect for them so I think that we've um, we've got a lot of good referees but I really agree with Hugh's thing about education uh, and actually making them more rounded as people because you know there's some referees go out there and they're nervous as kittens mm, yeah. absolutely nervous and you, you know from the the start of the game they're going to make mistakes mm. and and uh, when I was in Morton a couple of seasons ago there was a referee came out and um, started the game made a, an unbelievable error started running about book, I think he mm. booked about eight players because that, that was his idea of taking control again uh, yeah. and the game just finished yeah. and I spoke to the observer and he says oh, that's, I'm afraid that's him He's, he'll not be back in this, this league again wow. and so it's, it, there's a lot of pressure on them no, absolutely. I think the thing is I was saying to you uh, I found out in the um, not only the referee in the park by making a mistake, mm. but the guy in the VAR studio gets demoted if he makes a mistake and mm. what he relays to the referee. Mm. That's you're putting up pressure on people for the start. Why should why should they do that? So I think at the top, uh, the the referees, it's a culture, it's a culture within referees. So change that culture, and if it is going to the successful countries, then go go and change the culture and make it so that, that referees have a bit of humility, as, as Stuart says, yes. and they perform. I'm glad the two of you mentioned that. No mention of the society we live in and the conspiracy theorists that abound. Um, uh, but that's, well. that's <laughs> football, you know, I mean, you're always going to get, I mean, people always say, oh, it's Scotland, but they'll get all over. I mean, Benfica fans will be going on about how Sporting Club got a decision the other day. Balker will be going on about River Plate. I don't get worked up about that. That's football. Yeah. That's what football fans do. They argue about it. That's why it's so important. I just think what we really have to do is this is a big, big business, and that's what it is. People talk about it as a sport and all that. And it is that. It's a big business where people's lives and, 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 and money and futures are on stake. Why not make it as best as we can? And why don't we look at good practice throughout the world? If you look at uh, Ange Postacoglu or Michael Beale or Stuart Kettle or Stephen Naismith or in, they'll be looking at the best coaches through the world, they'll be looking at Pep Guardiola and say, how, how, how does he set up this way? Well, how does Iceland a few they years ago? Spend some and they spend time, time they go yeah. and, they go, and a part of course is your UEFA yeah. licence, it's to go to another club. Well, just just again to try and offer a bit of balance. There might, oh, what balance? There, might, there, might, there, might be a, there might be a referee out there who's saying, by the way, we do that. Mm. 
it, listen, but that you don't might hear happen. About it. Well, of course, but just because you don't hear about it doesn't say it doesn't mean to say it doesn't happen. I mean, the referees you know? do go and, and do uh, uh, training camps. The, the, the big one in, uh, in, in uh, used to be in, 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 in La Manga, every and in, in the worker. I just think that you know, I think the uh, you know when Crawford Allen came on board, it was a chance just to change the entire culture and say, listen, it's been run this way for a certain amount of years. Let's let's think. Let's see if we can run it on our way. Yeah. Let's see if let's, we can. Let's get the media out there mm -hmm. at these training camps. Mm -hmm. Let's get you go out and film in a, a documentary about it, and I'm sure that it would uh, change people's perception because the, there's some really good guys amongst referees. Oh, I. I mean, nobody's criticising. Nobody's criticising them. But as they people. do. So they make it errors. But then the thing is about let, let, let's let's try and make it better. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's talk about some of the players who are playing the game. Some of them are not happy as well. Uh, Robert Snodgrass says he's going to tell his side of the story after uh, the shock hearts exit. Um, this is a statement that he had to make on uh, the departure from the club. Uh, I just want to thank Hearts for giving me the opportunity to pull on the jersey and play back in the Scottish game. A big thanks to the fans for making me feel loved again. Your support has been superb home and away. I'd like to thank Robbie Nielsen and Lee McCulloch for bringing me to play football in a really good team. I was emotionally attached uh, to and determined for us to kick on. The previous six weeks had been a real challenge for us all, but that's when a team sticks together, digs in and fights for the guy next to you. I was in for the fight and desperate for third place, but that chance was sadly taken away from me. It left me gutted and disappointed. And he goes on to say uh, in the second page, I wish the club all the best for the rest of the season. I loved working with a great set of boys, helping and developing the younger boys game. Uh, the amount of positive texts I've received from the dressing room leaves me no doubt I've made friends for life. I will definitely tell my side of the story, but right now isn't the appropriate moment. Out of respect to my team and the supporters, the focus has to be on third place and I hope the boys smash it. Well, so there's a story to be told. And uh, the story, uh, as far as I'm concerned, mm. is Robert Snodgrass's level of professionalism is not matched by some of his mm. teammates. Yeah, I think that would be um, uh, a, a reasonable, um, I think that'd be a reasonable inference to take from that. And another inference to take that is that Robert Snodgrass's um, realisation of that wasn't taken in silence. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and he made it, you know, made it known. That, uh, and again, this is supposition on my behalf. I don't know that, but I would imagine that he's made it known that, that uh, he's not happy because that's what players, big players, and he's a big player. That's what they do in dressing rooms. Yeah. They, they say, you know what. I'm not happy about this. I'm not happy about the way we're going here. But when he voices that displeasure, some players can't take it, Davey. Well, I think it's it's about how it affects the team. And, and, and I think that, um, you know, managers that I've played under love players, you know, speaking out in the dressing room, uh, criticising things, certain things that are not up to standard. Uh, and they embrace that. Maybe that's not been embraced properly, and uh, I don't know what reason. It might be as simple as uh, actually the first time I saw that Robert was leaving mm. um, was the fact is I thought it might be down to some kind of monetary thing. Uh, yeah. Because he's he's sent off. Mm. I don't know how many games he's suspended, mm. and somebody mm. may have said, you know, can, is he we, work up, mm. can we get an agreement mm. with him to terminate his contract? Let me throw this spanner on the watch to you. He was one of the better players. Well, sometimes decisions are made in boardrooms that's not about football. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. That, does that surprise you? No, 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 <laughs> no, 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 not at all. I mean, I mean, at the end of the day, we all know that there's there's a bit of um, a fallout in the background with the team. Mm. That's yeah. that's the first thing, which he will undoubtedly tell his story on that. Um, and obviously, you know, uh, through contacts, through listening to people and what's going on in the background, he'll tell his story. I'm sure. Uh, some of the other players who might not be, uh, might be in his firing yeah. line, um, will have a different story to tell. But uh, you know, I watched Hearts on more than a few occasions this season, and he's a standout. Oh, I, well, and, and, and again, that's not a, a shock. I mean, he's, he's, he's just out of the English Premier League. I yeah. mean, that was his last gig. You know, so let's be let's be honest with this league in the English Premier League. If you're going from the English Premier League to this league. It's not like for like. No. So he's going to stand out. And he was always, he was always a beautiful player. And I use the word, the term advisor. He was always a beautiful player to watch because of the way he can manoeuvre and I play the ball. Bit and once you're finished, it's like, um, I actually uh, locked him in a, an office when I was chief executive <laughs> of Dundee for six hours 
to try to persuade him to sign for uh, First Division Dundee instead of Leeds. Uh, is that right, aye? And I tell you, what a professional guy he is. His standards, yeah. and there's a big thing about standards, he's got huge standards about training and about playing. And, and you know, sometimes people don't like that because they have to raise their standards to aye. do it. And, and you should try and be all you can be. But can I just, conversely, can I say about Stephen Naismith again, he was uh, a young player when I was at Kilmarnock as the chief executive, and he is a strong mind willed and minded. He's a great guy, and he has amazing standards as well. Mm. So I don't think that's what makes me think it wasn't Stevie that made this decision. Mm. Yeah, because absolutely. I Aye. think it was out taking out his, his hands because what manager coming in, you know, as a caretaker to prove yourself would want not want somebody like Robert Snodgrass. Exactly. And and you they made a good point about both characters is that the reason that they both got one got from Townhead and one got from Stewarton to play in the best league in the world wasn't it because somebody uh, they rubbed a, 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 a magic lamp and a, a genie came out they got there because they they, they, were, they got for Kilmarnock yeah, to Everton to Everton and, and, and look at look at Snoddy Snoddy was in loan at still in Albion yeah well I'm looking at <laughs> some, I'm looking at some of the feet here some people don't like Robert Snodgrass no. um, that's fine um perfectly entitled oh. to your opinion uh, some people um, offering their opinion on a sensible point on this issue um, Robert Snodgrass has got his time to tell his side of the story um, and some people who might be in the firing line can maybe hit back that's the nature of it football is a, a passionate sport um, and it's got nothing to do with whether we like him or anything mm. like that claptrap that I read sometimes on here um, at the end of the day we're giving you an insight into uh, the story itself, how it's going to develop, what our knowledge is of it. Uh, and then from there, all Hearts players have to do is step up to the plate and see if they can finish third. They've only managed to lose six consecutive well, games and lose third place. And, and I thought they were going to be a shoe in for it. Well, I, a shoe in I think, for I, it. I think Aberdeen have got it. Right, they're, not, they're done now. Yeah. I, I mean, I would say Aberdeen. So you look at Aberdeen, Aberdeen, the team, the third best team in, in Scotland, right? The team that wins the other league. What we call the other league, because you take Celtic and Rangers yeah. out of it for real things. The team that was on the league were beaten by Darvel in the Scottish Cup. There you go. Yeah, absolutely. Here's, uh, here's <laughs> Patrick Mullen, who's been out there at uh, the Hearts camp today. Stephen Naismith was speaking at the Orion this afternoon ahead of his side's fixture against Ross County on Saturday. Despite a difficult start to his tenureship as manager of Hard and Midlothian, he wants to see his side return to an attacking form of football. You need to go and win games now. You're playing against what's going to be the best six teams that, uh, or the best five teams that are, over the course of the season have made the top six. So it's not a case of just we're going to go all out attack, but we need to carry a decent threat every time we play. But growing up, when I came up against Hearts teams myself and I didn't play with them, there was always an attacking threat and it was always tough to play against Hearts. Robert Snodgrass has released a new statement this morning expressing his sadness about leaving Hearts amid Lothian, but Stephen Naismith has insisted that it has been no distraction to his Hearts players. No, because it's not been mentioned since, uh, the only time it's been mentioned is right here, right now. Um, I don't think it's a distraction. Like I said, we've moved on, our focus is on the games, trying to get results. Um, and that's where we're at at the moment, it's definitely not a distraction. OK, uh, we'll find out if he's not a distraction. He's gone. Can the other players step up to the plate? Um, and as far as the weekend is concerned, Hearts are against Ross County. I thought maybe Ross County would show something, Davey, but they haven't been able to do it, even when they brought in those strikers in the window. Yeah, well, they've, they've actually done that in previous mm -hmm. seasons, so yeah. they always you know, seem to kick on from it. But you know, I, I think the thing is that, um, as I kind of recollect, the kick on in the, the, mm -hmm. once the split's done, mm -hmm. Because it's cup finals, really, yeah. isn't it? And and I think they they're motivated enough to try and overcome. Mm. Who's the going? Who's, who's going down? I love these questions because you know what? You, do you know why? I love these questions when you come into the studio because you've always got your played with that many teams. Yeah. No, not, not only that. I mean, there was a few actually speculating all the teams. I mean, I've got Rangers, Partick Thistle, Kilmarnock. Anybody else? Airdrie Rangers. Uh, sorry, uh, Saints Rangers twice. Yeah. Uh, I was at Arsenal for five years. Yeah, uh, absolutely. But you, when you were a chief executive, you've been a chief executive on a number of, of um, uh, occasions I always like to ask you this question because <laughs> you know that ducker and dive so who's, going, do, who's going down I, I hate to say it but I think Kilmarnock are 
probably. I watched them against Celtic in that opening mm. 20 minutes, and although there was individual mistakes, which Derek McInnes is a very, very good manager, you can't legislate mm. for, but you could see that there was a fear in the players' mm. eyes, and see when it comes to the five cup finals of the split, you need to look at players in the eye and say, are you going to mm. perform? And yeah. I didn't see that in the players. I don't think that um, they're cohesive, and, and I think that... Uh, they are very, very worried about it. And see if you get into those mm. games worried, you're going to end up bottom. Uh, here's another so thing. I think they're real under pressure. I think I agree with that. And see when you see the post, sli the, the post split fixtures, if they get three away from home and have got two at home, you're saying there's a case to be made that the best they can get is six points. Yeah. Out of five games. Yeah, because because they, get, they get nothing. I think they've yeah. well, they a couple of points away from home. Yeah. So, yeah, and I, I just think. Um, I agree with David. I, I think the whole mood around Kilmarnock is, is 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 pretty depressing at the moment. Okay. Um, as far as the uh, games are concerned, um, Hearts against Ross County. Of course, Kilmarnock are at St Mirren as well. Give us your thoughts. Uh, David thinks Kilmarnock are going down. I share that view. Are you Kilmarnock? Yeah. Um, you might think differently. Who do you think? Um, let us know. Uh, and thank you at the halfway point to so many people um, offering their opinion. And let's not forget so many people who tune in through the podcast and listening to the programme as well. And if you download the PLZ Soccer app, you can uh, get all the breaking football news and you can watch it on your phone, your tablet, or indeed, as many people do, on the smart TV, mm. um, which is the modern thing. And quite a lot of people, actually, from our stats, are basically putting the programme up on the television mm. and watching it now because, as you know, Hugh, it's changed days. Terrestrial television is dead, mm -hmm. and uh, the digital platform is where uh, everybody is and going. And everybody can watch now when they want to watch things. Uh, absolutely. So, um, from uh, maybe an unhappy camp and an unhappy player in Robert Snod, Grass uh, to an unhappy manager um, because Callum Davison has been out. It's, it's if we're always getting letters going to the SFA, <laughs> we're always getting a st Scotland loves a statement, doesn't it? So here's another one from uh, Callum Davison who I've got a certain amount of sympathy for. I'd like to thank Steve Brown and the St Johnson Board for giving me the opportunity to become the manager in 2020. I was proud and honoured for any football club there is always a better chance of success when there is unity. When everyone sticks together, positive things can be achieved and with the full backing of the St Johnson support, Stephen and the players can finish the season well. Uh, finally, reflecting on my 14 years with St Johnson, I'm very proud to have been part of what has been a very successful time in the history of this wonderful club. Thank you for the memories. Well, that is tremendous dignity from a, a guy who was a fabulous player for St Johnston, but a manager that I don't think will be surpassed for what he achieved with a double. He's a legend there. I mean, I mean everything. And I understand the St Johnston supporters. They're worried. They're anxious. The, the, you know, the, the, the idea of falling down a division has become... A, a, a problem for them. And I'm by the glad way, you said that. Do you know why, Hugh? Mm. Because we get we discuss and we try and discuss, and of course, Celtic and Rangers dominate everybody's thoughts in the majority of uh, platforms. But we get lots of fans, and we try and discuss mm. every club. And we got a St. Johnson fan who dropped us a, a, an email, and he just basically Ross Mitchell. Thanks, Ross, for dropping. He says, "I listened to Tuesday's show, and uh, I'm a season ticket holder at St. Johnson." Um, and the comments from the, me the media from the people who don't watch St Johnson as regularly as I do and the fans um, Callum will always be a legend he says from being a player getting the highest ever transfer fee assistant to Tommy Wright in the cup final of 2014 and of course double as manager he should have a stand named after him um, he says how long do you give him credit in the bank uh, the way uh, the media are talking around it, it's like he should have been untouchable. Mm -hmm. Nobody is bigger than the club, it says Ross. Um, the team have been terrible for two seasons. We haven't won at home since November. Uh, we're on a horrid run after horrid run. We'll be knocked out of the cups at the early stages. Kelty, last season, for example, there's been no fight. The team look lost. We concede at an alarming rate and we can't score. Don't get me wrong, the players have a hell of a lot to answer for. St. Johnson fans are pretty patient uh, and to hear the boos of late uh, just shows how bad things have become. People refusing to renew season tickets and avoiding games. It was getting toxic. Um, if he remained in charge, we were going down. It's as simple as that. The team 
are in free fall. They're not a sacking club. He's the second manager to be sacked in 18 years at St Johnston. Um, and that shows this. He had been given ample time to improve the team and more funds than any previous manager ever had. So he was backed fully. It just stopped working. Um, and thank you to Ross for giving us that insight. Um, I don't know how the team is going to react under Stephen McLean or if we're even going to get a bounce to win a couple of games. I hope we do. Time will tell. Well, that's perfect. I mean, that is but I think in punditry, uh, there is, I wrote this week that the, you know, people said they sacked uh, Callum Davidson uh, too soon. They, they maybe sacked him too late. That's the problem. Yeah. He could have. And in, in, in punditry, everybody looks upon a club outside and they go, oh, well, they, they won this cup and they won that cup. You see, the whole thing about football is what have you done for me lately? And what you're looking at, this is not this season problem. This is a two season problem. Yeah. So Callum and Callum are the first, and I like Callum Davidson. And I tell you another thing as well. I've got a lot of respect for his coaching abilities as well, and so have other people. But it wasn't working. And if you're a fan there, you're quite right to say, listen, you know, this is a huge decision for the club. So I think they could have. They probably were too lenient and, and gave him too much time uh, because he did get back in and he, he, and. That free fall thing's the interesting thing because see if you're sitting about seeing who's going to go down, right? You yeah. sit there and, and I think Kilmarnock will go down. But, but I don't know that. But you can make cases for, you see Dundee United, well Jim seems to be getting a bit of a, Jim Goodwin seems to be yeah. getting a tune out of him. Ross County, well Malky always does quite well. They've got two strikers in Davies saying the cup finals, this is where the strikers make up. You're, you're making cases for the team. Yeah. You're looking at St. Johnson, you said. They've just jumped to a plane through a parachute. Yeah. I mean, on that basis, I, I, I mean, I look at the, the their team, uh, and I look at the players that were riding high in in twenty twenty mm. as well. The other big problem that maybe a lot of people might not take into consideration is they sold some of their best defenders, mm. you know, and and trying to replace them at a club like St John's. And that's all right, saying for a Celtic, okay, you can lose a Virgil Van Dijk, and then you can maybe go and find the next golden nugget. It's tougher in their market financially. Well, it is, and, and you know, I think, I think when you actually analyse um, Scottish football at every level, you know, there's wee pockets mm. of, uh, at the top, Rangers, Celtic, others, mm. they fish in the same pond. So getting a gem and bringing a gem through is probably the difference between winning the league and losing the league. Yeah. But at the bottom, you know, there's probably half a dozen <gasps> teams who are talking to agents about maybe another hundred pounds or another two hundred pounds. So you get a player that that performs for you, you might get a player mm -hmm. that doesn't perform for you. And that's the difference between winning a success. And I think St Johnson maybe, as you say, it has been too much of a claim for them to try and replace some of the mm -hmm. defenders that they had. Because they were they were very strong at the back. I watched the the game uh, highlights at the weekend. But also I think the, the key is that they're, they're, they don't look Confident in front of goals, yeah. I know. Well, two crucial, or three chances they had, and you know, good strikers. Yeah. Well, they they do have good strikers, mm. but they don't seem to be knowing where the goal is at the I, moment. That's what I look at as well. See if I'm looking at the bottom of the league, I'm always saying, see if you've got a chance of somebody scoring for you. And I look at Dundee United, and they've got a class striker. I mean, Fletcher's still yes, yeah. class. He just is, and you see the goal he scored with the header the other week there, which looks so easy. But anybody's played forward goes, that's a, that's a hard finish. And he just, it's just bang. He's going to see it, and you look at Ross County and you say, the two they've got up front, particularly Brophy, come, you can see goals there. You're looking at come on at St Johnston at the moment, and going, do I see goals there? Well, strangely enough, I, I think, you know, with 32 points, I think they might just have enough to scrape out of that playoff. They might, yeah. You know, um, they are at home to Hibernian, um, with, of course, um, and that derby win, everybody on a high from that Edinburgh derby win. But uh, it's a tough game. It's at McDermott Park. And if you join us on Saturday afternoon, um, Kerry Pollock will have the preview in the Saturday morning and in the afternoon, Tam McManus and myself. Uh, we'll have reporters all over every Premiership game and uh, the big game in the Championship as well. Ali Graham will be covering that for us. So our reporters will bring you half-time, full-time reports and the reaction from the managers and players as well. It's well worthy of downloading that or indeed hitting the subscribe button on the YouTube channel. And of course, as we're talking about uh, clubs that have to try and you know go into that market and get bargains uh, suddenly Michael Beale has probably got the most pressured job for me over the summer uh, in the fact that 
the demands, the expectation at Rangers, he's got to try and find not only players, um, say goodbye to some, but find players that can hit the ground running, David. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the thing is, if Rangers and Celtic, you cannot fail to compare them. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you look at Celtic, they've got two players out of contract at the, the moment. I think Hazard, who's the reserve goalkeeper, and is it Iwata, the mm -hmm. midfield player. That's the only two players they've got. So they've got their recruitment right and they've also got their contractual situation right Rangers conversely have got nine players out of contract mm. and a lot of big names in that mm. and, and when you actually think about it is you've got Kent Morelis you know when they're getting into the last few months players sometimes they, you know they switch off and they think about their next next um, vocation but I think that um, Rangers really need Michael Beale needs to get players in. He's got a churn of nine players, so he has to get players in that are better than he's he's getting that are leaving the club, um, and he has to get them on contracts that will maximise their value. Because Morelis and Kent, irrespective of what fans think yeah. at the moment, they'd a value a, a significant value last year. That. They're walking away for nothing. Yeah. Now, no club can sustain that. So he's not only get. The, the issue of getting the right players in but he's also about how he can actually manage that squad to maximise any revenue that he's due and he's come out as well Hugh and said that his summer recruitment he wants it done before the qualifiers in July he'll need to have it done before then because that is a huge hurdle for them and it's a very difficult market and David will know this better than anybody it's a difficult market if you're going with a lump sum and a transfer and saying I want this player if I would imagine that Michael Beale will be dealing with a lot of out-of-contract players. And if you go to an out-of-contract player, by their very definition, they don't want to move quickly. Why would they? If Michael Beale comes saying, I'll give you four reasons at Rangers, Rangers, 20 grand ahead, well, thanks very much. Well, they would say their agent will be. What's the first thing the agent's going to do? They're not going to say thanks very much. They're going to go to Burnley or to Aye. whatever. Do you know I've just do said that? Call, I mean, Michael Beale wants 20... So it is, you know, it's a very difficult process, even if you've got the readies to bang down to get a player through. Yeah. That's why the crew, Celtic had readies for years, and everybody, the lump, we, we, we've had this argument for years. We had the, you know, we had the recruitment, and I said, because the recruitment is difficult, because players at that level, if you're trying to recruit a player for Champions League, that means he's a champ, you think he's a Champions League player, Champions League players have options. Yeah. Yes, but, but that argument is a separate programme, Hugh. Yeah, it's what I've done. Because you and I disagree no, on when like, the player has the, to be signed. Yeah, and I think, but my point of view generally is, players now have got options, you can better believe that the SPFL will not be their top option. They'll come, you know, they'll yeah. come. But they'll want to know what else is out there. And when I say players, I mean their agents, before they say, yeah, we'll sign on. And that's why it takes to the, the, the end. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one man who's delighted to sign a one-year deal is Johnny Hayes. 35 yep. years of age, signs another deal for Aberdeen. Well done to Johnny. Um, good lad. Um, and of course... He's one of those guys who's been lucky enough. He's played for Aberdeen, then nipped out, won everything with Celtic, and then nipped back in again. Yep. Um, so I think uh, a lot of the Aberdeen fans really like uh, what he's doing. The weekend is is one of those situations where we've got Hearts against Ross County. We've talked about Celtic, mm -hmm. Murrow, St Johnston against Hibs, uh, St Mirren against Kilmarnock, and then Dundee United against Livingston. There's some belters. Uh -huh. Livingston maybe looking at it and thinking... This could be another pipped at the post for the second season in a row. And if that happens, David Martindale, I think, is not looking on this season too uh, positively. So if we don't make top six, I think internally we'll see it as a little bit of failure because I think we've had one foot in the door most of the season. The third part of the season in terms of match day 23 to match day 33 probably hasn't been quite good enough. We've not had that continuity. Um, so we'd probably see it as shot ourselves in the foot slightly, but I need to remain pragmatic in that. If he gets into the top six, I think that's incredible, based on his budget. Well, absolutely, and I think he's, you know, can't uh, over um, state how well he's done mm. with that. You know, And again, he's fishing in that, that bottom pond, if you like, yeah. to try and get players. But he seems to unearth for some great players. But do you know the big thing when I when I hear managers now of Livingston, for example, Livingston probably three years ago were 
in the championship mm. and they had a really a great workman like team played for everybody mm. and came up it's about managing expectations then what, what's a good a good finish for Livingston I think finishing in the league is probably a good oh, so, but well, he has 10th 10th magnificent on that budget he to aim for the, the top 6 because he knows he's got the, the capabilities mm. of it but you know Will it be as a big disappointment? I so suppose to you know to to his expectations, but not to the expectations of the the, the public. Yeah, I think he's done a fabulous job. Of oh, course, well, he's up, I, he's he's up he's again. Point, I mean, he's done the job, and it's fact. It's not an opinion. The, the thing about football nowadays, Peter, is you can just about predict everybody's place by their budget. That's what works. Football There's no great big secret. You can buy, you can buy failure. We know that, but mostly it goes by budget. His budget's Probably the lowest in the league. Yeah. And he's still about top six again. He missed out last year, we know that. I think that's success. I'm glad you said we can buy failure. We're going to talk about that in two minutes, but <laughs> he's up against Dundee United at Tannadice, a club that Jim Goodwin uh, mentioned today. Everybody had written off. You know, there really is uh, a feeling among the group that they just want to go and make amends for what's been a very difficult and challenging season. And I think we've gone some way. Um, in recent weeks to showing the fans that there's a group here that really care um, you know going into the Hibs game three weeks ago we were five points adrift at the bottom of the table and you know everybody outside our group probably had written us off but I think it shows the spirit and the character that's that's within the team that um, they weren't willing to accept that well, fair play to Jim Goodwin. He's managed to get a spark out of them, and I don't think anybody would have anticipated if he had said, by the way, Jim Goodwin's going to nip off from Aberdeen, <laughs> where he failed, uh, and become Dundee United's manager and potentially get them away from there. But that's uh, on the cards if he can again get a win at home against Livingston. Um, St Johnston against Hibs and Mirren Kamalik and Aberdeen Rangers on the Sunday is always a tasty affair. Um, you can give us your thoughts on that. We'll be discussing it in greater detail tomorrow as we look ahead to those weekend fixtures. Hopefully you can join us for that. Um, but here today, um, might as well look back about managers who can buy success or failure. Last night, Champions League watched it. Bayern Munich against Man City. I don't think anybody anticipated that Man City were going to lose it. I couldn't see them lose it. If anything, I could see them score a couple of goals as Bayern Munich became desperate. Then this is not a good Bayern Munich team. This is a Bayern Munich team with Marmor uh, capitulating on a weekly basis are still only just ahead in the league. So it's not, a, it's not a good team. It's not a happy Bayern Munich team as well. I think what it does give us is it gives us uh, a terrific semi... Well, there's two great semi finals as the Champions League, but it gives us a, a real <laughs> Man City with Real Madrid semi-final. Yeah. Goodness. It's fantastic. And, and David, I thought I'd give you... I thought I actually put this together with Blair <laughs> just on the basis that you're a chief executive who would appreciate this. So here's Man City's lineup last night, how much it cost. This is just the starting 11. Um, yeah, you've got Ederson, you've got Akanji, you've got Diaz, you've got Aki, Stones, Rodri, Silva... De Bruyne, uh, Gundogan, Grealish and Haaland and the total cost of that team, 534.3 million. Now, there's a side that he's put, he's spent a lot, that's only the starting 11, Hugh. I know, the other ones are not like... And, and, and is that, should he be winning the Champions League with that and will he win it with them? Well, I would say, I mean, I think Pep's a great coach and he's influencing, co and his influencing other coaches has been huge. But he doesn't win enough, and people go, "Why? He's won four. Uh, he's won four Premier Leagues out of five, and that. He's, he didn't win a Champions League with Bayern Munich. He's not won a Champions League with Man City, and he won Champions League with Barcelona when he had Xavi, Iniesta, and Messi. I could have won a Champions League with that. This is a big, matter what the, the, the apologists say, yeah. this is a big season for him. He's got to win the Champions League. You don't need to shout at me, I'm in your <laughs> calm, I'm in your calm. I, I, a lot of people look at it and I, I, I'm looking at that side and I'm saying to myself, OK, I've watched Real Madrid now maybe four or five times uh, this season, uh, three of them in the flesh and they are magnificent. Just before we put the graphic up though, Give us a figure that you think the Real Madrid side cost. That Man City side cost five hundred and thirty-four million. Half that. Half that. Yeah. Davy, you know, honestly. Oh, good to God. That's a great, great guess. Two hundred eighty-seven point seven million. Courtois, Carvajal, Militao, uh, Alaba, 
Camavinga, uh, Cruz, Valverde, Modric, Rodrigo, Benzema and Vinicius Jr who for me is the star man in Europe right now. Um, I mean look at that side and, and by the way I mean, I, I was asking the question, I wonder if Ancelotti's one of the best European managers ever. Well, I think so, but I was actually interested in the first one, the point three, yeah. the point seven. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great, wouldn't <laughs> it? <laughs> it would be, wouldn't it? Add them together. Yeah. But, uh, no, I think that, that I, uh, I don't know, I always feel that Manchester City were aside. Maybe I didn't give them the right credit, but... It was it was not good football to watch. It was a bit boring side, a pass, pass, pass across the pitch. But I actually I watched it last night and mm. I saw them with different eyes. I thought that you know um, they, they they obviously are well up from the first leg. Uh, it's about containing teams, but mm. I thought they fought hard. And I think you know the star players stepped up to the mark, and that's what you want to do. That's what you pay them for to step up. So I think it's going to be an intriguing. Uh, game against uh, Real Madrid and you know as you say it's a big test and I think if Man, Man City win go to the final they've obviously got a hard task against one of the Milan teams but um, that will basically I think mm. draw a line under it and put, put the ghost to rest really with Which I agree and, and I, he needs to do that I think he needs to do it as well and, and, and two things about that I just look at that Man City team with my, my BVB top and look there's three ex Dortmund right. players on it you yeah. know and, uh, are they going to win the Champions League in a word I'll say no Yep, I would say no. Yes. I'm saying You're yes. You're going yes. Right. I thought Man City would win it, but I just I'm so impressed with uh, Real Madrid. It defies you belief. Know, it'd be it'd be so surreal if they they beat Real Madrid and got the final and one of the Milan teams beat them. Yeah, <laughs> Pep scored that in them though. Because I, I, Pep, I mean, Pep they're beaten by Chelsea in in, in, in in the final. You know, because and, and he does things which are beyond it was you know he, he plays all season with a, a, a holding midfielder and then he goes to Champions League final and he drops his holding midfield you go was I, I think that yeah. I think that's his that's um you know his flaw that if he if he does get through this gets there you know you would you would almost say well it's not going to be as clear cut as, as you would imagine yeah I mean, uh, Inter Milan beat him under Mourinho uh, the Chavi the Iniesta team uh, with ten men, yeah, absolutely. It's going to be uh, it's going to be interesting to see what he does. But I think you know when you spend, uh, I have it at a billion. Some people have it at only eight hundred million. Yeah. Um, what's a hundred million between friends? Um, there are uh, games that you can be watching tonight if you're in control mm. in your household. Um, <laughs> Europa League quarter final, second legs: Feyenoord Roma, Juventus against Sporting Lisbon, uh, Seville against Man United, and USG against Bayer Leverkusen. Yep. Um, so there's some really interesting ones there um, and I, I tell you Man United Seville is going to be a belter it's 2-2 two -two. it's so evenly balanced um, also let, let's not forget in the Conference League as well you've got Roma against Feyenoord uh, Union SG against Leverkusen oh I've got I've done that bit sorry I'm just testing you uh, you've got AZ Altmar against Anderlecht in the Conference League Fiorentina against Lech Poznan Nice against Basel and West Ham against Ghent and as ever we always like uh, you know, a Scott to do well on it. Oh. And Davy Moyes, you know, he could be leaving West Ham in the summer having won them a European trophy. I, I think I've said right from the start, I think a manager's job is to raise expectations. So isn't it incredible that West Ham are expected to, to win the European Conference League in one of the, there's only three European competitions to be in and to give us the chance to do that and people think that we are worthy of it says a lot. Yeah, fingers crossed. Yeah. Here's hoping Davey does it. Yeah. I'm slightly biased. I know I get it in the neck on this programme, but hey ho, anybody who's a Scot who's down looking anywhere, we, we want to see them do well. Aye, he's, he's a good man. He's a good guy. He's, he's, he's managing under pressure all the time. And I bet he says, you know, the big, his big thing at the beginning of the season wouldn't be winning any you, you conference leagues. He'd be staying in that division. Yeah. And it looks um, as if he's going to do that. And that's, that's, that's an achievement. Success. Yeah, that's, that's, on that's that budget, you're absolutely right. Um, <laughs> listen, it's been an absolute joy with you two. We could have we could have actually talked a wee bit longer, um, but uh, uh, sadly we've run right out of time. Uh, don't forget, hit the subscribe button on PLZ Soccer's YouTube channel. We had a quiz question, um, which uh, I think Aye. was it's a good one. Name the first player to win the SPFA and the SFWA award in the same season. And and the thing is, I'll give you a wee clue Aye. before I go there. He played with them. I, I bet he did. But, uh, Do you know this, Davy? Um, I was actually thinking of something completely uh, different. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to say. Yeah, but you uh, played with him. 
Um, so we now know it's a Rangers player. We now right? know it's a Rangers player of a certain vintage. Yep. Uh, Give us a name. I don't know. Scottish football writers, player of the year. year. And and I'm now going to give it away because yeah. I'm going to say he could play uh, centre forward, midfield, or centre half. Derek Gucci. Johnson. Derek. Derek. There you are. Well earned. Well, well um, and and sometimes forgotten what a player he was. Oh, absolutely. absolutely top drawer. Um, Derek Johnson was the answer. Mm. Did you get it? Um, it was 1977-78 season. Um, hard to believe he never even got a kick in the World Cup of oh. that year. He was a top scorer in Scotland. Absolutely magnificent. Anyway. I uh, like to talk about football, like to bring you the managers and the players and all the burning issues. We deliver it, you'll get opinions, you'll get a bit of banter here and there. And of course, it's growing bigger and better and lots of great features coming up for you over the next couple of months through the summer and into next season as well. Hopefully, you can join the football family by hitting the subscribe button and hit the bell as well. From Davey McKinnon and from Hugh McDonald and from myself, Peter Martin, thank you for watching.